Hey, nothing too much, man. Thanks for agreeing to do the interview. Yeah, no problem, bud. All right, cool. Uh, I just want to start out by talking a little bit about uh, this Wicked Nest, which of course has been out for about seven months now or so. It's you know, it's now it's kind of starting to have a bit of a career of itself. Uh, how's the reaction been compared to the last two albums with the songs live and everything? Uh, you know, it's been good. I mean, you know, everybody's everybody was really. Um... Well, as far as the old school Hellstar fans, they were much happier with this record, you know, so, um, and we kind of knew that was going to happen anyway. So, uh, yeah, they, they, the label, everybody was really excited about it, and a lot of people were comparing it to, like, it could have been easily the record right after Nosferatu and would have fit right in, you know. Um, but yeah, other than that, the reaction's been great. The songs are going over really well live, and, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's all I can say, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's cool. Uh, I thought it was interesting when I was listening to the album that uh, initially I was expecting you guys to go even farther than Glory of Chaos, you know, because you did King of Hell and then Glory of Chaos was even more brutal than that one. But I actually yeah. thought it turned out, and I, I really like those jobs myself, I thought it was, this, it was a cool new approach. I know some of the old school fans maybe didn't like it quite as much, like you said, but this one I think balanced the two really well. So was that was, was that like a conscious decision you guys thought while you were writing it, or did yeah, that end up that yeah, way? And, yeah, and no, it's kind of like we... Uh, I know, especially Larry, he doesn't like to use the term that we don't, you know, we don't put too much thought into what we're writing. We just, what we're writing, we just like it. We have to like it ourselves. And that's true to a point. But I mean, I know that it would be um, completely safe and honest to say that, I mean, I know the conversation came up that, um, you know, may, uh, it, you know, I think we got as heavy as we needed to get on glory. And I think that now we found our plateau as far as heaviness and fastness and darkness. So, yeah, we didn't need to push the envelope anymore on that, you know, spectrum. And we know that there was a, cu a couple of those, like, you, you know, we call it the old school diehards that, that, that you know, uh, that were a little offended by glory. Not offended, but I guess shocked is the word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, especially with all of my negative. Come on, that that really didn't yeah. feel that didn't feel good in Oliver's butt from Keep It True. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> nah, I love Oliver. He's a cool guy. But, no, I mean, you know, so I think a lot of them just thought, man, you know, that's woo, you know, okay, you know. The, the good thing about all these old fans, they know the band is still a very, very high – profile musicianship band so it's not like oh they're just terrible musicians now all of a sudden that i'm sure it was just one of those things that um you know that yeah it did it did uh you know it did kind of uh, bother some people i think and um you know so we, it, it, that and that was it, it was important to us but it wasn't at the same time like i said we, we need to be happy with what we're writing and when we did glory for some weird reason we just it was in pumping through our veins at the time when we were recording the record and it came out that way but the, the the other reason why Glory came out that way too is because 75% of Glory is what was going to be the Eternity Black project that brought Rob and Larry back into the music business. Mm. So and what we did was we just took um, a good chunk of uh, their little demo that they did, and I just did then I just redid the vocals. We didn't really change much as far as the heaviness and the fastness of it, but. You know, I just went ahead and put the James Rivera spin on it, and it automatically made it a Hellstar record, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that that's kind of the whole deal with that, you know? But, uh, yeah, I think that with Glory, we, we, we found our, our plateau as far as, like, you know, okay, now we don't have to go any further. I mean, almost about as – I mean, that, if you didn't know that was us, you know, I mean, like a <laughs> lot of people say it now, they just think that's some new black metal band that they hadn't heard of yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so uh, – and that brought a lot of those fans crossing over to like us that didn't before. So you see, you, you kind of win some and you lose some, you know? Yeah, that's kind of how it goes, I guess. And plus, I thought that song was one of, one of my favorites from that album, even. You know, I was just, and uh, and being someone who, who really loves, you know, Nosferatu too and a Distant Thunder stuff too, but I, I thought that song was just cool to hear you guys just go all out for one, for a track like that. It's just insanity, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah, and I've I've always wanted to do a black metal project, anyways, because I, I like a lot of it. I like the very melodic stuff, and of course, most of it's from Norway and yeah, yeah. Sweden, Sweden, and I, I I just you know I was like an old Dark Tranquility fan for many years. And oh, awesome. Old, old Sentence fan, of course. Old Man's Child, all that stuff is like what was Thy Serpent was. Dude, that's totally my cup of tea, you know, and. Uh, it's very atmospheric winter music. That's why I like it, I think. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. That's a good way of so, putting it. Yeah, so when it's 102 here in Houston and humidity's up to 98% and I've got an <laughs> afro instead of long hair, I'll put on some dye serpent and all of a sudden I, I just pretend that I'm up in Finland somewhere in an igloo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a bad way to do it. So is that, is yeah. that something you're still thinking of doing? Possibly like you'll be doing uh, your James Revere mm, vocals over like some really extreme metal music? You maybe you know I mean I I mean it would be it did like the Alma Negra character you know that's what we call him yeah. the Alma Negra guy I I might just for the hell of it for shits and giggles I might do a full on project like that one day and not even really hype too much that featuring James Avera from a Hell Star and just see what people think about it first and then then go. Well, by the way, that 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 is James Avera's new project from Hellstar, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and then it would you know because I think if I promote it first that I'm doing that, then you're going to have a lot of frowns already, anyways. Um, there are a lot of uh, you know old school metal heads like my you know like there's some friends of mine in Austria that they love all kinds of metal, so they they love they would love a black metal band just as much as an old school power metal band and equally. So like with those people in in, in especially is why I would probably want to not mention too much um that it's me involved just let the thing come out let everybody get it and go wow who is this maybe even go under a weird stupid satanic name just so that it throws everybody off like you know mugok or something i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that, that could be pretty interesting um uh, yeah so i'm kind of curious cause i was actually when i interviewed harry conklin of jag panzer i was kind of talking to him about this too because you guys kind of from a bit of a similar scene i guess you could call it from from the 80s where it was like you said sort of i guess people call it now the old school power metal kind of approach um, right. and you know a lot of the a lot of kind of in the internet age there's a lot of fans of that stuff that kind of group it all into a certain category i guess because it's not in the 80s it wasn't quite slayer nor was it you know poison or something so was there actually like a scene back then of of bands like you guys and with with hellstar and jack panzer and those kind of groups or is that something that people have since kind of looked at and said these bands are kind of similar so this is kind of a scene unto itself no we had our own scene we had a really big we had a great texas metal scene i mean matter of fact a lot of the uh europeans that's what they refer it to. The Texas metal scene is like their favorite. And, uh, and, and ironically, the Texas metal scene was the bands that were a little bit more technical. And that's just the way it came out. We don't know why. We, I say it's the weather, you know, that, that, that mm-hmm. you know, um, that's all I can think of. It's good because we all have something in common, you know. Uh, but, you know, like you think about Watchtower, and then there was the San Antonio Slayer, and then us. Then, you know, it was like peas and carrots. You know, a lot of bands were wanting to sound that way, you know? Mm, yeah, so yeah. I think we were just, maybe we were the bands that were just more heavily influenced by the Iron Maiden episode saga thing, maybe. And that's why our writing abilities were, you know, well planted in those roots. And that's pretty obvious when you listen to it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, at the time, I don't know if, if if it got like a whole bunch of media coverage or anything in, in terms of like metal magazines and stuff. But people nowadays, a lot of the times, if they were around at that time, look back at that the era of metal, the 80s, you know, and they think more just about thrash and glam. And they forget about the fact that there was also that that other approach that was maybe a bit more technical and also more melodic, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, I thought that was interesting, and I want to go back a little bit and actually ask you when did when did you uh, first decide you wanted to be a singer professionally? When did you kind of like okay, uh, this is when I want to do this? I think this the, the about the time when I first started getting into um, Scorpions, Taken by Force, and then I think it was then it was also a Rainbow, uh, rock, Long Live Rock and Roll album that was kind of like our the the uh, a constant you know on um, constant playlist of the cars and you know the homes back then between me and a little group of friends, I think then is when I just hearing those singers is what made me all of a sudden go wow and I, you know I would love to be a singer but like singer like this you know and yeah. because at that time 
those were so underground records that the mainstream was all about Kiss and Ted Nugent and Aerosmith, you know, they yeah, didn't know yeah. nothing else. We were the weirdos that had these albums, you know, you, we used to go to this tip, this like a, a very underground record store that had all this stuff imported already, you know, and they came in the little plastic thing and all that. And, you know, so <clears throat> this, it just all happened with one friend in particular who's discovered this stuff first and i guess and there was like a little circle of us that started discovering it so we were anti aerosmith and anti everything that was popular at the time you know so it's kind of weird you know <laughs> and this was the way to go that was satanic <clears throat> to me that i mean that's what a lot of people thought they're like man that music's kind of dude that's that's evil music dude <laughs> <laughs> like, oh Rainbow, yeah. <laughs> yeah you ain't heard evil dude you don't know what's coming around the corner in another 30 years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny, huh? That that's evil. That Scorpions is about as bubblegum as Walmart now, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and, and uh, did you, when you were starting out with the with uh, singing in a metal band and stuff, did you have to work on your technique? Like, or maybe did you have days where you're like, oh, my voice isn't really feeling so good doing this. Maybe I should try a different approach or anything like that? Yeah, well, see, that's the whole thing was that, you know, um, it was natural for me to sing. I guess I've, I've always enjoyed singing since I was a, a my mom said that's what I did. One word started coming out of my mouth, I guess, way back to when I was however old I was, and I don't know how old I was when I started speaking, is that every time I spoke, I spoke in melodies. And she thought that was very interesting. And that's my dad, I guess, had said that. He goes, Oh, he's going to be a singer when he grows up, you know. And But that's. I guess I wish I would have some of that recorded. That'd be great, you know, but I don't mm -hmm. know what words I was saying, but anything I spoke was in melody. <laughs> so they found that odd. So when the Beatles hit real big, oh, yeah, I was singing every Beatles song backwards and forward and note for note, you know, so it, and I was only six years old at the time, so, mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, I guess it's been kind of in me. But professionally, no, I never thought about it, and it just, it all happened, uh, uh, you know, just in the garage one day, just picking up a microphone because some guys were playing some Scorpions, and, and that's how it started. But So it started naturally, and then after the first album, Burning Star, <clears throat> yes, I, I realized that, hmm, there's got to be something that I'm not doing that these guys do because they go on tour, and how do they do this every night? When I do just this one backyard party, I'm shot for a month, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... It it just it it uh, it occurred to me, and I got very lucky. And um, a um, at this time now we're talking 1984, Burning Stars out. I'm I'm a full on, somewhat local rock star now around the Houston area. You know, and I have a lot of fans, a lot of friends, and ran. I just bumped shoulders with a guy that was working on some artwork for us, at this art institute here in Houston. And he just so happened that, you know, I told him my problem, and he said, uh, you know what, man, you should go see this lady. She's the opera teacher at our school. She's the vocal trainer. She's really cool. So I guess he took the album to her, and, um, and she called me, and then uh, she offered to give me private lessons at her home, and I did because he told her the problems. <clears throat> and she goes, yeah, I know what his problem is. He's got a great voice, da 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 da, -da. So she says, well, we got to do with you little boys, teach you how to breathe, breathe from your diaphragm and sing from your diaphragm. And I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's a living, it's, a, it's an everyday way of life for me. That's how I breathe for everything I do. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, that's funny that you, if you don't know that, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the main, it's 90% of what is uh, operating your voice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that's that's so to answer the question, yes, it did start out naturally, but I did have problems, and then I did take lessons after Burning Star. Yeah, yeah. So tonally, uh, like for some of the, were, were you always kind of good at figuring out how to do certain like crazy, like you know, for example, the high screams and stuff? Were you able to kind of figure that mm. figure that out just by hearing them and then emulating them? Well, it would you know, and of course before Hellstar, I was in many many. Uh, little garage cover bands, you know, and then we did backyard parties and stuff. And then our set list was, you know, it maintained as much of those kind of bands, uh, even Judas Priest. But I didn't have the Halford uh, thing in the very beginning stages of my life. It just came out of fucking nowhere when <laughs> I joined Hellstar and when we started to do our write those songs, the Burning Star songs that became the demo. And it just came out of nowhere. And, and 
I, yeah, I was shocked as hell. The band was shocked. And then we started doing more Judas Priest in our cover set. And they're like, dude, you got it now, you know, because yeah. I was more a D.O. Klaus Maney kind of guy, you know. Yeah. And I think that I didn't uh, I didn't really uh, I was intimidated by by Halford for sure. When I first saw him. Yeah, he, he really, you know, yeah, he, he kind of actually um, put a black shadow on me, you know, like for a while there just uh, to myself, I kind of thought, man, why did he have to come around? You know, I'll never <laughs> be able to do that. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was just so badass though, that to hear somebody do that, that I'm just like, where does he even, how, where, where's that coming from? You know? And he puzzled the shit out of me. And then, uh, one day it just came out. And, uh, so now, yeah, you know, the, it's, and it's obviously over the years, I've picked up all kinds of different characters. That, that's what I call them. I call them characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that things that kind of is interesting about you as a singer too, is because compared to maybe some of the other, uh, singers from the same era, you do have more of that, you know, that Klaus influence and that, like that really good clean singing approach. But then you, you also, for the higher stuff, you have that piercing Rob Halford kind of thing. Was it, and I guess as as you're kind of putting it, that sort of just came about from uh, from finding Halford at a certain point when you'd already been singing that way, and you just sort of added it onto what you were already doing. Exactly, I added I just added him into that to the mix, you know. And then um, you know, then then Bruce Dickinson came around. I added a little bit of his tones into the mix eventually. And the, matter of fact, a lot of the Destiny's End stuff, I used a lot more of those kind of tones than I do in Hellstar or anything else. And uh, which is why I'm doing an Iron Maiden tribute again, just because I'm like, hey, I, I miss that character. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then of course, you know, once the late '90s, 2000s came around, and I was thought, okay, now it's time to throw in the Danny Field crate uh, character. And, and so, <laughs> yeah, from there, you know, I just never stopped learning. I'm one of those things that's. I believe in that saying that, that, dude, no matter what you do, you learn something new every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you ever come to a point after you had, uh, you know, been torn a lot and you were making albums, maybe after, like, and you look back and you think, you know, maybe I should, I kind of wish I hadn't written this particular song so crazy just because I have to perform it live so much, or has it usually been pretty effortless for you? Uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 there has been a couple of them like that, that, you know, that I'm going, uh oh, what did I do here, you know? <laughs> um, you know, and actually, one of them, um, one of them, uh, one of them is the curse uh, that's on the new album. Um, you know that that's one of them for some weird reason. And that one, if you, if you listen to the chorus, you'll hear me pull out the old Destiny's End James Rivera character, more of the Dickinson kind of tones on that chorus. That whole chorus is completely just super powerful and high, you know. But it's not mm -hmm. falsetto or nothing. So. I pulled it off in the studio, and then I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> so to be completely honest, I'm not ashamed of it. Um, we have it in the set list. I do it if I'm up to it. If I'm not, I just give Larry the look, and he knows not to do it, you know, because at least I'm honest with myself. I don't want to go do something in front of 500 people that is just going to be half-ass, you know, so – They'll never know that it was in the set list or not anyways. We know that, you know, but I mean, that, it, and to me, that's not a coward's way of doing it. It's just being professional and going, ah, I probably shouldn't pull that one off tonight. Like, you know, let's give them 150% killer show from beginning to end. We don't want the one thing in the middle to be like, you'll start seeing those expressions like, oh, it doesn't sound like the record, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, there, there's been times when I've done that. And it's just because you're just overjoyed in the studio and you have all this time and you're just having too much fun, you know? <sighs> yeah. Well, also a singer is not going to be invulnerable. I mean, you, there's just, you know, some stuff you just can't do night after night, you know, but the voice isn't the same as a, as a guitar, you know, you can't just change the strings, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, I wish, right? I know it's like, hey guys, we before we hit the club, let's stop at Walmart. I got to go to the, get the voice <laughs> yeah yeah they got it on sale right now for 39.99 you know yeah, exactly. so yeah that's just that'd be great you know? <laughs> yeah uh but i'm also kind of curious because you know hellstar is one of those bands who you know you do sort of have a master of puppets album that you made with nosferatu so you people do you feel like it's been sort of a gift or or a curse that people so much kind of know you for making that particular landmark metal album you know um, well, it, it kind of both, you're right. Um, I would say that it's, um, it's kind of strange that you, that we, I don't mind it so much sometimes. I just think though that sometimes people get overboard with, with narrowing down to one thing and they don't want to think outside the box, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now I think the album is probably the album. Yes, you're right. That's the most critically acclaimed album and all that. Um, it, musically, it was you know beyond anything we've ever done, 
But I think the, the part that I don't mind about it is that the fact that, you know, we did it all about Dracula. So, uh, sure, I mean, that's cool to, 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 to know that people know you for that. I mean, even Anne Rice acknowledged that album, for God's sake, you know. So, <laughs> wow. And, you know, if you think about it, here's the, the, the sicker part of this whole situation. Dude, we were way ahead of time with the vampire craze. If we were new now, phew, yeah, we'd, yeah. Be, we'd be headlining small little Verizon theaters at least by now, you know, I mean, because <laughs> the, the, after, especially after all the damn Twilight movies and all that that came around, we'd be on top of our game, you know, I mean, it, it's just a shame that we thought about that 25 years too early. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, that's just insane. But, you know, I mean, that does bother the hell out of me every time I go to Hot Topic and see all the little vampire wannabes walking around and going, man, these guys, would our album would be in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Or yeah. any gothic clothing store or something, you know, I'm just going to just it just it boggles the shit out of me. Yeah, I can imagine. So and, but it's yeah, with, with Nosferatu, I think uh, I mean, of course, I love the album, too, but I think, you know, some people. Once they find that classic release and they kind of stick, okay, now this one I like the most, this is the best, or whatever they put in their head, you know, then they're maybe a little less accepting of, of a newer approach just sometimes yeah. you know, for new albums that's, and stuff. Well, yeah, that's the part that does boggle me sometimes, too, is that, look, you know, look, you know, that was so many years ago. Even if we could give you Nosferatu over and over again and you put a gun to my head, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah. it, was a, it, it was a magical moment that, 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 Went from the brain to the hand to the pen to the pen to the paper, and and it was at that time frame, and everything that went into the you know to the whole uh, episode of making that record was then. It's no longer here, so it's impossible for us to do that. You know, so if you're not going to like us anymore because we're not going to do that again, you may as yeah you may as well not like us again. Stop liking us now because that's never going to happen. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got to keep uh, doing different things. I think you know. I can I can only imagine being in, in your scenario with that, where you have these you know people kind of want you to do something from so long ago. But you know, at the same time, from what I can tell, having talked to people, there's a lot of fans of current Hellstar too. So it's definitely not too much of an issue, I guess. You know. No, no, no. I think it's we've kept a pretty well balanced fan base. It seems like some fell off, but a new ones came on, and it's always kind of been consistent with our turnouts at our shows and things like that. So we're pretty lucky about that, you know. And of course when we play live, we do everything from the beginning till now. So you, the, when you come see us live, you're going to get your fair share of everything we've done over the last 30 something years. So yeah, yeah, and that's 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 definitely a cool thing to do too cuz you know, there are some bands who get criticized for playing too much of their new material maybe and not playing the classics, but it seems like you guys find a, a good balance between those two. So Exactly. So yeah. That's cool, yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm also wondering a little bit about Destiny's End because I, I'm definitely quite f fond of those two albums you guys did in the late '90s, early 2000s. There, um, how did how did that project kind of come about? Um, well, actually, I, I, I was uh, it's like '96, '97. I, I um, closed the book to Hellstar for a bit. Yeah, that's I disbanded the band. Um, we had been doing quite a bit around here in the Houston area still, but it was time to call it a day. And I up and moved to California to join another friend of mine's band, and then I, and I also got a job offered at the same time. So it was kind of like a win-win situation. And since I am part Californian, um, because I was raised over there, and I've gone back and forth several times to, for di at different periods of my life to, to live again, and so I'm a Texafornian. That's the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. And it is my preferred place to live as far as you know happiness. It's just it's so expensive that I and because of uh, where I'm at in my life with everything that's going on, I you know I know how to live within my means. And unfortunately, hot, humid Houston is the best place for that. You know, <laughs> so right. So, um, but I went back to join this band and help you know get the job. And then we did a demo, and Metal Blade was going to sign it. They thought about it, but at that and it this project was called um, Chaotic Order. And uh, it sounded like Pantera meets Alice in Chains meets Queensryche, you know, so it was kind of a weird modern thing. And I thought for sure that's what they want because, yeah, that's the other thing that was so disappointing. It seemed like at that time, you know, real power metal stuff was completely dead, or at least that I thought it was. All it was doing was the, the egg was opening again in Europe. <laughs> mm, so yeah. when I gave them that, they were like, yeah, it's good, it's good, we're – 
really considering signing it and da da da. But man, we really just kind of wish you had a Hellstar project. And I'm like, <laughs> what? That's the kind of that's the stuff I just walked away from because you all were saying, ah, that's dead. And, you know? <laughs> well, what it was was everybody was starting to sign at that point. I think Nevermore had just inked with Century Media, Hammerfall inked with Nuclear Blast, Ice Earth inked with, I think, Century Media 2, and I think Metal Blade wanted their power metal band. That's what, you know, so like, we're going to have one of those too, fuck them, you know? Mm -hmm. So at, while I was there at the right timing, that's when the, 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 the owner and the main president took me in the office and said, man, I'm telling you right now, James, if you can... I know it's, it's probably not it's probably possible to get the Hellstar guys together, but if you need a project, something like that, man, I mean, <laughs> and it's going to fly like a rocket. You know, trust me on this one. Well, it just so turns out that I had to go give this band the bad news, uh, you know, that they weren't really they're looking to sign it, but they want me to put something together more like Hellstar. And the I don't know how it happened, but the there was a guy that uh, he used to work for a, a little, I think, the uh, – tape trading thing called Sentinel Steel back in the day. And he got wind of this. He found a way to call me and told me there's a band in Los Angeles called New Eden. Dude, you really need to check them out. He goes, they're very like Hellstar-ish. I mean, you're going to love them. And they're having a lot of problems with their singer, from what I understand. He's a great singer, but blah, blah, blah. That's how it happened. So I ended up meeting those guys through this guy. I joined the band. And then the one guy got thrown out of the band, <laughs> and that that there's that's why the New Eden name went. And then Dan DeLucy came up with the name Destiny's End when we got Perry Grayson in. But we still kept a lot of the same material because Nardo wrote a lot of that stuff that we were gonna use for what would have been a new New Eden album. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's so. The... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so that's kind of how that all happened. Hmm, yeah, well, it's, it's really cool because, you know, around that time, like you said, it seems like the sort of power metal approach was c coming back around. Uh, and, and it is interesting, too, because like you said, just a few years prior, it was kind of had gone away. But then you had Eister and you had Hammerfall and you had all, you know, Nevermore and all that kind of stuff. Uh, w were you like particularly taken with those bands when they were coming out or were you kind of con like, huh, what? <laughs> you know? How was your reaction when that new wave sort of happened, if you can call it that? I was I was excited. You know, I was like, well, man, you know, my you know, my cup of tea is coming back completely in full swing, yeah. you know, so I was real excited. I felt like we were like a, I felt like we were a um, coalition of a military going, OK, man, we're. Let's go back. Let's go and take the music back from these fucking heroin addicts. Yeah, <laughs> fuck this, fuck this scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And so we we did the we did it, dude. That was the, the one of the best times of my life. The six week tour in the U.S. with Ice Earth, Nevermore, and Destiny's End. Talk about a you know rebirth of that's what the tour was called, the rebirth of heavy metal again. You know, man, and that just Dude, everywhere we played, places were packed, you know? So, yeah, we felt like a military, you know? We felt like, yeah, we're we're taking this shit back, dude. You know, you guys can go kill yourselves on heroin for all we care, and, you know, <laughs> show up with your flannel shirts and your backpacks, you know? <laughs> Do what you want, but this is what the kids are going to start wanting, and sure enough, you know, it did hit again, so. Yeah. Of course, yeah. I always knew in the back of my head, though, um, just because I'm a realist, it I knew that the scene would never come back like it used to be. I knew that, like, bands like Ice Earth and... Uh, you know, even Hammerfall weren't going to be selling out the Astrodome and stuff like that, you know, yeah, so, yeah. you know, but still, at least to be able to play some cool venues to, you know, 800 people and stuff, you know, was exciting again, at least. Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, I think, you know, sometimes just going to play the, you know, to people who really want to hear the kind of stuff that you're doing, I imagine is probably even more satisfying than playing to a, a bigger audience that is more of a mixed crowd, you know, in that sense. It, it totally, yeah. But yeah, so that's that's awesome. And uh, I think it's kind of interesting, too, how now it feels like there's still, you know, definitely an audience for that 
classic metal approach, even though, you know, we have the online, everything's become digital and there's all this stuff going on. There's still people, you know, who want to go out and see the, the, uh, the classic style bands, be they newer or older. So do you feel like that's still the case or is it kind of? Waning? Yeah, no, I think, I think metal's doing, it's doing, it's doing fairly well again. It, it's almost being considered normal again now, though. That's the weird thing. You know, heavy metal now seems to be like a household name and it's not so unusual but that's because the people that are pulling, well, not a lot of the strings, but the people that sort of keep, you know, our, our age bracket that's keeping this country alive right now and keeping everything moving is because we're, we're are the, we are the metalheads. We're all, we now, we're all the parents. We're all the same, the people that loved that stuff. So naturally, we're going we're gonna to try our hardest to hope that our children would like it as well, not force it down them. And that's what's happening. So now it's it's dad and sons going to concerts, or it's moms and daughters, and it's our moms and dads and the whole family going to metal <laughs> shows. Yeah. And that's that's pretty fucking cool, you know. As long as there's the metal bands to keep go to keep you know to, to keep going to see, then uh, you know that's the that's the cool thing that I've been noticing, you know, at the shows lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's pretty. Uh... That's pretty. That's definitely accurate from what I've come across too, because, you know, there's this thing where now you can be a metalhead and you're not frowned upon maybe as much as before, a little bit, you know, just because, as you say, like a lot of people that are in power are, are, were metalheads back in when it was, you know, a newer thing. So that's pretty cool. Well, you know, just think about it. If you were, if I was to see Larry and Rob and Mikey in their daytime attire, uh, walking through some crowded mall at their lunchtime, I would walk right past them and not even give them the horn sign, like, hey, at all, you know, yeah. I would give, they just look like any corporate guy to me, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's the, that's why it's not looked upon that way no more, because most of us are just, most of the metalheads are normal people now, that they're just regular, you know, regular working class people that still listen as soon as they get in their truck or their car right after they leave that office they're blasting out some you know fucking judas priest or something you know <laughs> yeah, yeah i kind of wonder sometimes actually if part of the whole norwegian black metal controversy was part of kind of trying to bring the whole danger aspect back into metal a bit a little just because around the time that happened like the early 90s you know i guess metal of in general was a bit more obscure you know, at least in america it definitely was i mean i don't know what it was like in europe but you know, then you're hearing all those stories. I, I sometimes wonder if they were partially kind of trying to add that aspect back into it, you know. But, I mean, you don't really need that when you just got really good music, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I know that, like, black metal is considered almost mainstream in places in countries like Norway and Finland and things like that to the normal people. They're not offended by it at all anymore. It's like they're almost kind of proud of it, you know. Like, I, I think I was, where was I, in Germany, and I was taking a train somewhere, and... It was a crowded train, and, you know, we got our nice little cultures that we were all raised with, and I had a good old mom and dad, and so, you know, there, it was real crowded, and there was this this girl, you know, maybe, maybe her mid-20s, she had like a backpack, she had a lot of shit on her hands, and I said, hey, you know, I'll offer you my seat, and of course, the, over there, they don't get it. <laughs> you know, they're, you know, like, no, 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 please, you, you take the seat, please, and, and so she sat down, so we started talking, yeah, she was from Norway, and then she was telling me that she's, a, I think she's a banker, she was on holidays, going to Spain, blah, 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 and I said, oh, that's cool, so you're the only, no, no, I have a brother, he plays in a black metal band, they're really, really good, and, but you could tell this girl was like, nerd as nerd as nerd can get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she was so proudly talking about her brother in a black metal band, you know, she was, you, you've heard of that, right, I go, of course, you go, I go, yeah, she's like, oh, yeah, he's in a, He's in a, in a really good black metal band and stuff. I go see them sometimes, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it's become so mainstream over there. I, I think if, if you even walked around with the corpse paint over there, people wouldn't even look at you twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I remember reading somewhere that in Norway, that's actually their biggest cultural export from their, their country is black metal now. And I, oh. I it's kind of weird. I wonder if you go into a record store there and there's just like rock pop and then just black metal. You know, section. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that'd exactly. Be, yeah. That'd be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, but going back to some of the stuff that you've done in the past, I'm kind of curious about also your somewhat brief tenure with uh, Vicious Rumors with the Warball album. Because uh, I think... I could be wrong here, but wasn't that like their reunion album after a certain amount of time of not having done much? 
It was the album, um, and I proudly say this, and I think the guys agree, we're all really good friends. It's the album that brought them back to life, period, as mm. the vicious rumors that everybody missed. Because there, there was a, I know that there was a period where I think Jeff was still, yeah, Jeff was still putting out some vicious rumors records. Um, he even did some where he was doing the singing too as well. Then he put out one or two, I think, with this Brian O'Connor guy. And it just it seemed like they were doing a couple of things here and there. They got a couple of tours doing stuff like that, but it just seemed like musically it still wasn't – the albums weren't doing anything. The, the, the reason why they were surviving was because they'd go out and do all the classic songs live. So the fans were going to at least still hear everything they wanted to hear from the Carl Arwood days. Mm -hmm. But I think when we did Warball is when it – that's the closest it got to – being back to that classic vicious rumors kind of sound because of my voice i guess you know so then it was kind of the yeah the album that, that brought everything back in full swing you know mm -hmm. yeah and plus what i think is cool too is you have you can do that sort of carl albert approach but you don't sound anything like him with your voice and that kind of helped it be uh vicious rumors again for the new era in a way which exactly right right you know so that was kind of the cool thing about it yeah, and uh, now was it when you came into the band though? Was it kind of known that you weren't going to stick around for a long time, or were you expect, or did you? No, think you I, we to... thought we were going to do. You know, I thought I was going to stick around for a good while, but you know, you know, things happened, and that's just the way it was. But I mean, I, yeah, there was you know plans to do another record, and you know, we 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 got to do the good. The thing about being when I was in the band is that man, we did do a lot of very great, successful things. I mean, shit, the band. I mean, immediately I got the band over to Spain to have, be a part of a big festival that we ended up getting two nights out of, uh, and, and we did a few shows in, in Europe while we because we were going to Spain anyways. And then I, you know, uh, we did two more European full tours on Warball. We went to Japan. We toured pretty much all over the U.S. So we did a lot of cool shit, man. Mm, yeah. So you know, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that was really good. You know, I mean, so. Um, you know, but, you know, things happen, you know, people have disagreements on things and that's all it was. And, you know, I think too, I'm, I'm so used to sailing my own ship as well, you know? So, um, I think that's probably where the clashes came and, you know, and then the, the, the interest for Hellstar was coming back. So you see, so there was a lot of reasons why it kind of probably everything always happens for a reason. So, I mean, and, and Hellstar actually got signed while I was still in Vicious Rumor. So oh. right, we got I got signed uh, already with AFM. So and I already knew that I was going to be doing that on the side, and I think that didn't make Jeff too happy, you know. But yeah, I can yeah. understand that because you know he likes to have everybody focused, you know, 150 percent into to VR, and you know, and I felt like I could do both things, but maybe it, it felt a little threatening to them. So. Yeah, but nonetheless, it seemed to work out well for both of you. Yeah, cause... because now we've done shows together. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> you know? that's cool. Yeah. Plus, now you guys, you know, Hellstar's come back with doing, you know, this awesome string of new albums, and Vicious Rumors have gone on to make more albums that have been really well received, too, so that worked out well. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I'm also kind of curious about Malice, which is another band you're currently in, and you did an album with them a few years, just about two years ago, and that was... You know, quite a cool release as well. Is that a, uh, is there plans for another Malice release sometime? Oh soon? no, the band. The, the, see, I guess you haven't really heard about all that, but the band kind of just, uh, yeah, the band. Unfortunately, you know, and again, here's something that I'm not the driver of this car. So what, what can I do? I can only do. I can only when I join these bands, I can only add in 150 percent of my services, and which is what I do. But um, the whole problem with that band, dude, is it. It has a lot of issues. They, they're, uh, you know, they're 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 kind of still. Some members are still thinking that it's they were. This is the days when they were signed to Electra, and, and you know, and you know, and it's like it's not. It's a whole new scene for them, you know. But then the main guy that that kind of uh, brought everything back together, and it was my friend Jay Reynolds. You know, he got himself in a lot of trouble with the law, and so he went on vacation for the state of. Oregon, if you know what I mean, for a good while, and after oh, that, yeah. it was over. It was over, right? You know, what can you do? <laughs> oh, so, wow, yeah. Yeah, right. So he's out now, I think. He, you know, he's getting his life together again, but once you do stuff like that in the business, you, you, you know, the labels start losing interest, and, you know, they kind of don't have a respect for those kind of things, so 
yeah, and the label dropped the band, and from there on, everything just went to, to hell, you know? Oh, I can see, uh, yeah. Right, So, and it's too bad, because we, we never really got to go do a whole full new Malice thing. We just re-recorded a lot of the older songs with my voice, and then we did put four new songs on that that record as well but you know it would have been interesting to for us to see you know write a full on new malice record you know with what it would have sounded like you know Mm, definitely yeah i think i might have been i I don't know if it's been up on the internet yet but i was checking around on like encyclopedia metallum and stuff about uh (coughs) about the band and it was listed still listed them as being active and that you were still in the band so maybe they haven't gotten their updates no Yeah, that's too bad. But it was, you know, the, the, and the, a couple of the new songs were really, really good that we wrote, you know. Yeah, so, that's what uh, I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, well, like, especially New Breed of Gods. I thought that was a killer song. The funny thing about it, though, is that if you listen to that song, it doesn't sound like Malice from the day. It's it's a great just metal song. It sounds more like a Judas Priest song or something now, which they kind of did sound that way. But it's hard to explain. It's just because I guess their uh, their their two main classic albums are so old that but that new breed of gods doesn't sound anything like that. It sounds like it's date it's up to date with a lot of the metal bands today. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, part of the standout of you know m- making that track a standout is the kind of unique aspect of the whole thing when you put it together with the rest of the tracks there. Yeah. But uh, but you know we still obviously it's not. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's not a huge loss, but it, nonetheless, with Hellstar going now, I mean that that makes up for for that definitely. If if I can put yeah. it that way, because I thought it would yeah. be cool to have both going, but you know, then again. Oh no! I mean, I yeah. would have, I would have loved. That's what I was doing. I would have loved to have done yeah. that, you know. But it just didn't, it didn't pan out that way, and yeah, you know. So yeah, but other than that, right now, that's the main thing that I'm doing is just um is is Hellstar, and and you know um I do uh it was um there's. There's some stuff in the works about doing another Killer Machine record. Uh, we've, we've already demoed a couple of songs, um, and this time the lineup will be, of course, Peter Shittire, the, the owner, founder of KM, and me. But in the, this time on the rhythm section, it's going to be uh, the Wasp rhythm section, the Stet and uh, Johnny Rod. <clears throat> and um, then we'll just, as we're still looking for either a permanent other guitar player, or maybe we'll just have session guys you know one in the u.s one in europe when we go out and start playing live and that kind of thing but um and we're hoping that all comes to fruitation the, the demo is being shopped all kinds of things are being planned for the band it, it all comes together but um the other thing is is that uh, i keep i still can keep very very busy with my little enterprise that's called james avera sabbath judah sabbath so that is Actually, if I wanted to, I could just do that for the rest of my life, and I wouldn't have to do any original projects anymore, <laughs> because that's you know that's the thing that keeps me the most busiest. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, right, right. I have, uh, I think, nine bands now in America, and then I have four in Europe. So oh. it's kind of, and it's growing, and it's growing. Yeah, I have one in Los Angeles, one in Salt Lake, one in El Paso, one in Chicago. Uh, of course, the main one here in Houston, one in Pittsburgh, uh, and another one in Tampa, Florida. So it, it allows me to go cover a lot of the country with just one flight as an expense. So you see, that was the whole beauty of putting together this project. And then when I'm ready to go overseas, uh, and I usually the way I do it is, you know, like I say, Hellstar gets a tour. Uh, on, uh, after the tour, I stay for another two weeks and do a bunch of Sabbath Judas Sabbath shows, you know, and, and try to keep working. That's my whole attitude now is it's just all a job anyways. It's work. Mm-hmm. So I, I have one in Holland. I have one in Germany. I have one in Slovenia. And I have one in the U.K. So that covers almost the whole world already. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And that's what I knew. And, of course, it's obviously a tribute to Black Sabbath and Judas Priest, the Dio years. So, you know, that's kind of a cool thing that I do. Yeah, definitely. How do you how do you uh, put together the set list for that? Is it a consistent thing, or does it change quite? Yeah, a bit? it's the, it's the same set list. A few things are different here and there with each chapter, but I keep the same show pretty much. You know, mm-hmm. so it, it's kind of like a heavy metal Tom Jones guy just flying around with a different band all the time. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, why not when you can do that and you can yeah. cover all that area? That seems like the ideal situation, really. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is, and and every band is just as good as the other. So it's kind of you know people. Sometimes people ask me, well, which one's better and which one's your favorite? I go, man, that's 
that's something that I just can't answer. It's just that's that's just not right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. <laughs> that's <laughs> not asking me like what's my favorite James Bond. Now you know that's a totally different thing. But yeah, but they're all just as good as one or the other. You know, or they wouldn't be in the band. So there you go. You know, it's either they're playing with me, so they're going to be above average musicians. Let's put it that way. You know? Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I'm also wondering. Uh, just sort of in a in general thing is when it comes to the Hellstar catalog, are there any songs, both from the, maybe the newest <clears throat> album and from the past, are there any particular tracks that you're really proud of with your vocal performance? Um, on, the, on this latest one in particular? Uh, just in general, but it, yeah, it could be from the newest one or any of the albums, really. Uh, you know, I, I, there's, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes when I listen to, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm I kind of like a lot of the stuff. I, I mean, I love all the stuff I did on this last record. I, th- I thought, you know, it was taking me to another level again. Uh, um, I think, um, but, you know, I, then I, then again, you know, I think the King of Hell has a lot of good, you know, um, has a lot of good moments on that as far as vocals as well, too, you know. And that's probably because that's the first album where we started working with our producer that we've been using consistently since that album. So... Yeah, I think that was one of the first Hellstar albums that I was very proud of the vocal work again for once. You know what I mean? So it it kind of has a special place, I guess. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, I, I think that one too has a lot of my favorite vocal works too. The title tracks, one of my favorite ones with you know the King of Hell, and then Pain Will Be Thy Name, just all that crazy screaming parts and everything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, speaking of those. Uh, one thing that I also think is cool about your singing over the years is you have sort of developed, uh, as you say, you know, you've developed different voices. You kind of have gotten to this point. You have this sort of a new distinct style because you had the sort of the older style, and then now you can still sing all the old stuff, but with kind of a new approach instead of just kind of always doing the old thing. Uh, uh, with the really kind of the more der- deranged screaming kind of approaches that you're starting <laughs> to use a bit more of uh, – was that something that you uh, had to work on at all with the technique aspect of, or was it something that you figured out pretty quickly? No, yeah, it, it, it kind of came real quickly. You know, I mean, it, what it is is that it, it sort of, uh, it really came to me a couple of years ago when I was, you know, well, it came, it came to me through Sabbath, Judas Sabbath, because I, you know, Painkiller and Nightcrawler and all that stuff's in my set list. So really, it's I, you know, once I developed the, the you know, that technique of singing Painkiller and that 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 type of aggression with the high mixed, every the, all the rest of that stuff just came natural after that. It, matter of fact, I can do that easier than singing my regular voice. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry just it just tickles the shit out of him. Like he was telling one guy in an, in an interview, and he's like. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering how James can keep up the, I mean, so I guess maybe you'll do Alma sometimes, not every night in the set list. Well, when we had it in the set list, Larry's like, no, nah, man, we, we keep it in the set list. So James can sing like that for fucking hours. <laughs> you know, he, yeah, so that, it's weird that I can, you know, the guy in our producer and, you know, the studio guys, they just love it when it comes time to do those parts because they know, oh, he's going to nail these real quick. <laughs> then it comes to singing the simple, clean stuff, and that's where I got to do it over and over and over, and it's like, eh. That note's still not quite there, you know, but then give me the Danny Filth card and I'll, I'll just go through the whole song in one take, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing I kind of wondered about that, too, was that, you know, when you hear it, you think that you're, like, really screaming your head off and really, like, you know, just totally venting out the vocal cords in a way. But uh, so you say you found you have this way of doing it where it's actually pretty low aggression, like, for actually for yeah, your chords in a way? Yeah, it, it's just, uh, it's basically... Um, there is a technique for it. It is still almost doing, it's almost doing the high, the super high falsettos, but um, you're just using, you're just using your tones differently, and um, I can't explain it. It's kind of like a very, very uh, aggressive whispering is what it is, and that's what all those guys are doing. Otherwise, there's no way you could just do that with, you know, and just holler like that all, all you know, every, for two hours a night, and, you know. It's kind of a, at least that's what I think it is, because well, that's what it works for me. So it's basically a very evil, uh, loud whisper with a lot of wind, and, and you just use the voice to get the character, but the, the, it's all coming from the diaphragm. Mm-hmm. So and it's, and it's and it is completely painless, believe me. And it's it's weird. It is the most painless thing that I do when I sing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't understand it. 
Yeah, that is that is not what you'd expect, but it's interesting to know for sure, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And for the when you're doing that approach, like the you say, kind of that like loud whisper to get the sound, is that any different than when you're doing uh, when you're singing with your normal voice and you want to add a bit of grit to it? Uh, yeah, it's a little different. It's a, you know, it's like I said, singing with the normal voice and adding a little grit to it. You know, it, it takes a little more out of you, believe it or not. You know, so I mean, and it's not you know that that's just what what it is is too. Every time you do a new record, the hardest part of it is the first shows or new you know first few shows because. Um, you, it's like anything else, you know, it's like, okay, this time you did the three mile run and now you want to shoot for the five mile run, you know, so you got to start out somewhere. But what happens is, is your voice adapts. You start really, you start knowing exactly where to breathe, where you need to take your breath, blah, blah, all those little things matter. And then before you know it, the new songs are like boring to you now because there's no more challenge, (laughs) you know? So it's just one of those things that you have to, you know, that you, you do, you do, it does take some training to to uh, to start really being able to perform the new songs every time you have a new album out, um, you know, 100%. Um, and it's, it's always the first show or two, and I notice that all the time because I'm still not quite comfortable with, you know, and, you know, you be believe it or not, you're making sure you know all the words, all that little shit matters, dude. And if the, you got all that stuff down. And if you know what you're doing and you're singing properly, you, sh- you really shouldn't have any problems ever. You know, you could go do 30 shows and it shouldn't even matter, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you kind of have to get into that that zone where your, your voice is kind of, it's been you know singing a lot and then you get, kind of get to a point where you can keep doing it and it doesn't wear so much, I'd imagine. No, actually, it's better to keep doing it. See, that's the weird thing. When we have days off, I hate that. So <laughs> I try to find a karaoke bar as much as possible. You know, so and then I'll go do something totally different, like some Neil Diamond and, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> I was going to ask, yeah, what are like yeah. unexpected ones that you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, I do the Spinners and Neil Diamond and Engelberg Humperdinck and things like that. <laughs> now, that would be interesting to hear, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, people love it. You know, I do Billy Joel, a Piano Man, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 definitely interesting because that was something that I've a couple other people I've talked to about this have said too is that people think that you need to rest your voice after singing a bunch, but that's actually the worst thing you could do sometimes because in order to really you know make sure you're at your best, you actually have to be singing more instead of like taking breaks. It's just like anything you do. It's almost it's just like sports. You know, the minute you stop doing it, then you got to start all over again with you know all that training again. You know. So mm-hmm. it's yeah it is it is it is crazy. It's good to have a day off, you know, after I say like four or five shows, then you it's good to have a day off. And then four or five more, you know, five six maybe, I don't know. It it just depends. I just know that a lot of times, you know, I've gone as far as 15 and you know, there was no days off. Um but then the tour was over afterwards. So I don't, it's kind of hard to say, well, I wonder what would have happened if I had two days off, would I be able to go right back to it? Because when I came home and I wasn't singing for like the first few, three or four days, dude, it's almost like I can't even talk. <laughs> I mean, my whole, my whole speaking voice is gone, you know? And so, and it takes time for the speaking voice to come back. The singing voice is all back. There are two different things too. That's another thing. Your speaking voice and your singing voice are two different things. Cause I could get up and go, hey, dude, you know, they made a day at the fucking dinner yet. <laughs> you know, and then you're you're thinking like, oh my God, how's he gonna sing tonight? And then I'll get up there and sound like a fucking canary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so it's just weird. You know, yeah. so when I come home, I'm like that for a few days, right? It, 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 not the first day, but the second or third day, I'm home. I'm like, oh, you know, I don't even want to answer the phone. You know, so uh, I don't know what that's all about, but you know, then then it comes back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've actually experienced that myself just from some of the some of the singing stuff I've done. Like, I'll get to a point where my speaking voice feels really hoarse. My voice doesn't actually hurt, but it's kind of like, yeah, breathy. But I can still yeah. go and sing the the higher notes some, surprisingly well. I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, nice. yeah, it's kind of strange. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, thanks for the interview. I think that kind of covers the main okay. areas I wanted to chat about. Cool. For now. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. yeah, man, no problem, man. Uh, look forward to talking to you. So, where where are you at again? Uh, I'm in the in the northwest around uh, Seattle, Washington kind of area. Oh like, yeah, man. See, we've been trying to get up there for ages, and I. Uh, well, then again, I don't know. I mean, I could talk to you, and you could say, "Oh man, you got to come up here," and you could yeah, be yeah. my only fan, you know. But I don't really know <laughs> if there's a scene for us there. But apparently, everyone I've talked to in that area says there is a scene for us up there that we need to get up there. And 
I remember even Jay's girlfriend, when Jay was, you know, I was doing the Malice thing, he had a uh, little girlfriend that was playing guitar in a band as well. She, I forget the name of the band, but she's in Portland. And she goes, dude, everybody knows Hellstar up there. And I'm mm. like, really? That's weird. Yeah. I mean, how come we've never been up there then, you know? I mean, <laughs> yeah. But she goes, no, you guys have a lot of fans there. That's all the, everybody talks about. You guys, I guess because maybe it's the musicianship. You know, and that's kind of cool that if that's how you get known, is like when you're a, a musician and you're wanting to, you know, you want to really, really enhance your abilities for what, whatever instrument it is you do. That's kind of cool that sometimes we are one of those bands that people go, oh, dude, listen to these guys. This is some fucking shredding and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm, you know yeah. what I mean? So, and that's kind of cool that if you're just a kind of a, <laughs> Uh, instructional kind of band, you know, maybe they're not into the songs that much, but they, they, they get into the playing ability of it. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I just find that weird that, that I've heard several people say that, that we need to get up in that area. Yeah, yeah, I definitely would love to see you guys live. Now, in my specific town, I don't, I actually haven't come across very many other Hellstar fans, sadly, but at the same time, you know, I hopefully... There, there's enough yeah. for to actually get you guys to play here sometime. At least Seattle, or some, at least Seattle or something, you know, yeah, totally. Yeah, all right, man. Well, thanks for the interview, and uh, we'll stay in touch if anything ever comes up like that, okay? Yeah, definitely, and uh, I'll, t- I'll post up the interview on the Hellstar page when it, when it gets done uploading. You got it, pal. All right, Talk cool. to you later. Right, talk okay, to you bye. later, man. Bye.